Hello and welcome to episode 6 of the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. For the pre-interview section of this episode, I want to talk about a few of the DIY projects that I have tried. Now, some of these projects have been absolutely worth the effort, because the end result is, in my opinion, better than what is commercially available, while at least one has fallen well short of my expectations. So, for the good. First up was making my own aquarium lids out of clear greenhouse roofing material I bought at Home Depot for $37 for a 2 foot by 8 foot piece. With that one piece, I've been able to make form-fitting lids for three 10-gallon tanks and one 75-gallon tank. This material cuts extremely easy when you have the correct blades for your table saw or oscillating tool. I was able to make cutouts to accommodate airlines, power cords, hang-on back filters, and even the hang-on breeder box on the front of my Breeding for Karma tank. This material is incredibly versatile. I've added a simple knob to the front piece on each tank using Gorilla Glue. What's even better is that I still have enough leftover material for a 20, or maybe even a 40 gallon tank. I haven't measured that piece yet, but it will for sure cover the 20 gallon. The second DIY project that I'm quite satisfied with are my tank stands. I followed one of Joey, aka King of Do It Yourself's instructional videos for the majority of the design, then added in some trim ideas I saw from another instructional video. Altogether in materials, it was definitely cheaper to build my own stand for the 75 gallon, and it is without a doubt far more structurally sound than any stand I could have bought at a retail pet store. So that covers the two good projects I want to mention, now on to the bad. I had very high hopes for the LED light system using plastic rain gutters, reflective tape, PVC, and LED rope lights you can buy on Amazon. Now, I followed the instructions exactly as laid out in a video, but the results were far less impressive. I just don't think the LED rope light is powerful enough for my application, not to mention having terrible instructions to go along with a remote control that has a crazy number of buttons. For the price of materials and time invested, I should have just purchased the Nikru brand LED light from Amazon and called it a day. In fact, that is just what I did about 30 minutes after I realized how unimpressed I was with this DIY project. Now, if you want to try any of these DIY projects out for yourself, a simple YouTube search will give you more than enough videos to choose from. So that wraps up this part of the episode, on to the interview. Today's date is Tuesday, February 27th, 2018. Tonight I'm joined by Sam Scales, nature artist. In addition to being an amazingly talented artist, Sam also has a laundry list of a resume. He's been a radio host, a club DJ, an art teacher, a consultant for the California Department of Water Resources, and a lifelong aquarist. So Sam, thank you very much for joining me tonight on the Aquarist Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Randy. How are you doing tonight? Yeah, I'm doing really good. And, you know, thank you very much for taking time out of your evening to uh, to, to talk with me. I truly appreciate it. Um, I'm very excited to bring uh, you on the show with, with, again, just the laundry list of a resume of things that you've done um, in and around water and fish. I mean, it's really exciting to have you on. Um, and then also with your experience as a, uh, as a former radio host, you know, talking about fish, uh, fish stuff on fish shows. Uh, you know, having you on here to, uh, for me to learn as well, um, as I, you know, go on this, this journey of, of a podcast. So I definitely appreciate it. I really appreciate you having me on because I do miss doing radio. Um, I did it relentlessly for over three years and, uh, I always welcome the opportunity to get back on the radio and, and talk fish and talk reptiles and talk, talk whatever, every, every fascination I have because it extends well beyond the yeah, that's excellent. So, uh, you know, I'm going to do my best to, to interview you and be a good host tonight. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you're like, yeah, man, I'd like to go back on and talk with Randy in a, in a, you know, a month or so. And, uh, I'd be more than happy to have you back on Sam. So let's, uh, let's get started with how you got into the hobby. What were your earliest memories of, of keeping fish? Um, and just go from there to, to where you are now. Okay. Uh, to start off, I really, as even as a very very young child, I had a real unusual fascination for living things. So it wasn't really fish that started me off, but I think I you know seeing insects, frogs, amphibians, you know other uh, salamanders, lizards, those those kind of things really fascinated me. And I was uh, about five years old, four or five years old. I was really really heavily into to dinosaurs, you know, because uh, my my parents had bought me quite a few dinosaur books and you know just kind of feeling feeling the water or testing the water and trying to see what I was into and they were surprised that uh, not only did I read the dinosaur books all day and all night 
but uh, I was I was drawing them, you know, because dinosaur books we don't have any photographs of dinosaurs dead, but uh, everything in there was was illustrations and drawings, paintings, and I, I was doing the same thing very young age. So I started not only my fascination for for nature, but also for art uh, before I turned five. The fish came in uh, as I was exposed to public aquariums. Uh, so, you know, that, that the hobby for fish for me, it just kind of grew exponentially from that time. Now, at a young age, did your parents, did they recognize that you had artistic ability? Because I was drawing at a very early age, um, and I'm a terrible artist. So I guess at what point did your parents say, like, man, Sam, like, he's good at this. Like, he's he's different than other kids. <laughs> yeah, I think they did because, well, I, I probably inherited it from my mother because she was a very good natural artist. I have three brothers. All of them are are involved in the arts in some way or another. One is a comic book artist, another one's a graphic artist, and the other one used to be an art teacher. So I was the only one that took it beyond and became an illustrator and a, and a fine artist. But my parents knew right away, as soon as they saw me drawing, that uh, I wasn't going to be a typical young artist. I was going to be doing something special with art. So I really appreciate them nurturing that in me. Yeah, that that's awesome. Um, and again, your your art is absolutely fantastic. And we'll get into more detail about, you know, your specific pieces that, that you've done in, in the commissions. Um, but going back to you as a hobbyist now, so um, keeping fish, um, you know, what was your progression now that you, you've, you've taken an interest into fish? Um, what does that look like? And what kind of species did you tend to favor? Well, currently, I've stepped back a lot from from my uh, excessive compulsive <laughs> disorder of keeping fish. Uh, I started off uh, when we first moved to California, I was about uh, just before six years of age. And the very first thing I wanted for my own room was a fish tank. So my dad went at about five and a half years old and he bought me a book. It was a, a book with a brown cover. And it didn't have any color illustrations inside. And it, only like one fourth of it was about fish. It was called Encyclopedia of Pets. And the fish section was about a quarter of the book. But I was just so dedicated to figuring out and learning about every single species that was in that book. And, you know, my dad was like, wow, you know, this, this kid really wants a fish tank. So I, right from the start, I wanted to do things right according to the book. So, you know, he back then, that was a day and age when there was a lot of aquarium, you know, hobby shops around, as you know, they've kind of disappeared. You know, the economic times make it difficult for small shops like, like pop fish stores to continue to run. So, so we, we have a, just really a fraction of what we used to have. When I was a kid in San Diego, there was, there was literally a fish a aquarium related shop or reptile related shop around every mall. And uh, you'd go from here to there to there. And within, within three hours of jumping, you could go to 10 different shops. I've noticed that nowadays, as well. It's very sad. Yeah. Nowadays they're just gone. <laughs> yeah. So you got Petco, PetSmart, and then a few of the large independent stores. And it's rare to see a small, independent stores surviving nowadays. So, you know, I, I got that fish tank. I still remember the fish I had. The first fish I had was a group of zebra danios. I, I specifically picked out, at five years old, mind you, I picked out uh, two males and three females because I wanted to have a more female ratio. I didn't even understand the birds and the bees about, about fish. I just knew that that's what the book said. So. Do you remember why you picked zebra danios? Well, they were fast. And being very detail oriented, a lot of people would just see them as little striped fish. Uh, for me, I saw reflections in the stripes. So that's what I was telling my brother. I remember telling my older brother that they're blue. And he would say, no, they're just little black and white striped fish. And I said, no, if you look, 
when the light hits them, the stripes turn blue. And uh, that, and it said they were easy to breed. So, so I could I could produce more. You know, in my mind, I was thinking I could produce more zebra danios. And did you successfully breed those zebra danios? They laid eggs nonstop. I would get little wrigglers out of them, but. At five years old, I didn't know how to raise little wiggler fish from egg, so they would die. Oh, they, but you, the fact that you got it to, to wigglers at five years old, I mean, that, that seems really impressive. Like, your tank was, you know, obviously dialed in enough to make them feel comfortable to breed. So, I mean, you know, I'm already seeing a very bright future for you in the fish keeping hobby. As Sam, as a five year old, is, is having some real good success <laughs> with these zebra danios. So, um, how did your, how did your uh, time in the hobby then as an aquarist progress then from then having uh, zebra danios? Well, my first breeding success was the easy one. I ended up uh, getting some uh, platies. So I got some live bearing fish that were, as you know, they kind of breed themselves. And, uh, you know, you just end up with babies. So I was able to separate the babies, put them into a little breeding net, and raise them up to a size that they wouldn't get eaten by the parents and then put them back into the tank. So by the time I was, Six years old, I had a tank full of zebra danios, the five zebra danios, and a bunch of platies. Very impressive. Then, you know, fast forward, I, I kept getting more fish. My, you know, as as time went on, my dad bought me a few more tanks, which was kind of, you know, unusual at the time. He was like, "You want another tank?" You know, most kids are satisfied with one tank. And so, I, I'd say by the time I was ten, I had you know, half a dozen tanks. And I started keeping fish like uh, Central American cichlids. I had I had some some uh, Carpentis and I had Texas cichlids, the two different. And I, 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 what blew people away was I knew that there was a difference between the two. I also had pike cichlids. Back in those days, when you bought a pike cichlid, you just bought a pike cichlid. You didn't buy Crenicicla saxatilis or Crenicicla lubrubris. Uh, you would just buy pike cichlid, and no way, nobody really knew what species they were. In fact, if you looked in all of the the old batch atlases, they basically had like five species of pike cichlid, and they all had no scientific names. Now, were you into the scientific names then when you had these pike cichlids? Were you able to to differentiate? That was the thing, okay? So because technically the species that I had, which I later determined was uh, Cranicicla, trying to remember, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a blank on this one. Um, I am not gonna be able to help you at all on this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, half-banded pike in, uh, in Latin. I just can't translate it in my head right now. But that, that's one thing, it's an interesting thing that you pointed out there, that I was into scientific names as a little kid. Amber Daniels were Brachydani or Rario. Uh, Chinese algae eater, which I also had in that, is Gyronochilus imonerii. Uh, my platies, uh, you know, my and it made my brothers sick. They didn't want to hear it. You know, but my platies were not platies. They were Zephophorus, Variatus, you know. And so... Um, that that's the way I was with, with with my fish, and I also kept reptiles. I kept uh, uh, you know local alligator lizards that would live around in our neighborhood here. At the time, they used to be called Garanatus multicarinatus, and they changed names multiple times. Now they're Elgaria. Um, All right, so I've lived so... in San Diego before, and I know <laughs> I know the lizard you're talking about, and I can't stand those things. I, I mean, I've had I've had a bearded dragon, I've had an iguana. Those alligator lizards, man, those things give me the absolute creeps because they don't back down. Like they see a human and they will stand their ground and they'll kind of come at you. So <laughs> I'm, I'm personally not a fan of those guys. They, they bite and they kind of look a little bit like a half snake. Yeah. So what are you doing as a kid <laughs> with those things, man? <laughs> well, I, I had a talent of uh, making them tame. Oh. My so for my, all the neighborhood kids that wanted to have a pet alligator lizard, they would bring it over in a shoebox, and I would tame it for them. <laughs> oh my goodness, you're the lizard whisperer. Yeah, basically, I, I would, uh, and I had so many. I had probably like 
15 different cages and tanks in the in my I had a little patio and uh because it was a local lizard that didn't need heating or anything like that you know and so I had a little patio with all these little cages some of them I made some of them I just turned little plastic containers into cages and I had all different kinds and, and that um, I'm telling you I was like 10 years old and I had all these different I had the, the high red strain so I was doing like reptile genetics before most people even thought of that thing oh my you know goodness. like ball pythons and corn snakes and i'm guessing you had the blue belly uh the little blue belly guys right oh yeah i had i had more than just those i you know we'd go out in the desert and i'd catch lizards all the time so i had uh leopard lizards i had uh desert iguanas i had a, i had a chuck walla um when i was about 15 and his name was chucky that's creative and he was about 20 inches almost 20 inches long he was about 18 inch long lizard and everyone loved him. All right, and tell me, and, tell me, you're staying away from the rattlers, at least in Southern California. Yeah, well, I mean, I, for one, here, here's one thing. Okay, I, I really like venomous snakes, but I'm also uh, very fond of living. Yeah, okay, and <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm pretty logical when it comes to things like that. And and I've had, you know, I'm four years old now. I've had a lot of friends bitten by venomous snakes and I had to go through some some serious hurt yeah yeah um, a couple of lost things you know oh, <laughs> like man. lost fingers and and lost movement in their arms <laughs> yeah and uh and for those that don't know uh, in san diego i used to do some mountain biking over in uh mission trails i think it's called right um and <laughs> you know it's a it's a common occurrence there are rattlesnakes out there um, especially on the worst would be on really hot days. So you'd go out there in the evening to ride and as it cools down, that's when the snakes come out. Um, and the worst is when you're in a very, very low gear trying to climb. And so you're not going very fast and you're going uphill and then you notice that there's a rattlesnake on the trail and you're passing it going, you know, a half a mile an hour cause you're climbing a hill. That is the absolute scariest feeling thinking that this thing is going to reach out and uh, strike your leg. So <laughs> There are also <laughs> rattlesnakes where you're out there playing. Yeah, I've I've dealt with a few. You know, I, a lot of people call me around here. If there's a rattlesnake, they say, "Hey, uh, can you come and move this thing? It's in my yard, or it's on our street." And they don't want to hurt them. You know, I've I've preached enough about not hurting them. So they'll call me, and I'll just get it, and I'll walk it down into the canyon. You know, I use snake sticks, buckets, gloves, and. Uh, you know, just just do nature a favor and keep them out of the people's way, and then the people won't mind them. Yeah, doing doing a good service to your community and to nature as well, because uh, they're they're good rodent control as well. So, all right, so you are a lizard tamer. You've you've amassed a bit of a collection. Um, so let's kind of let's kind of switch gears into your um, career as an artist. And so, uh, you know, I want to give you a plug. And this isn't even one that's being solicited. So I actually have on order right now, and I wish I wish I would have ordered it sooner. Uh, a pistogramma hung hungsloy. I think I'm I'm butchering Hongsloy. Hongsloy, yeah. So I ordered that uh, that art print from your website, um, and we're definitely going to share the uh, the links to that. But it was your threadless website. It is an absolutely beautiful um, you know piece of art that you've done. And I'm going to hang it uh, somewhere in this general vicinity where I do this podcast recording so I can have it up on the wall. This is not a gift that you gave me. There's no discounts. I paid full price on your website because I think that this is an awesome piece of work. Um, I almost added the Oscar to it as well, but I have to sneak these things on the wall so my wife doesn't notice that I just plastered, <laughs> you know, four different pieces of, of fish artwork in my uh, in my office slash fish room. Um, so I'm definitely excited about that. So let, let's talk about your career as a uh, as a nature artist then. Okay, so I started off, you know, I've always drawn things. As a little kid, my two favorite things to draw were dinosaurs and airplanes. Don't ask me where the airplanes thing came from, and don't ask me where it went. <laughs> it was a temporary part of my life. Uh, for some reason, I was fascinated with airplanes. Um, I probably have not drawn one in well over 20 years. But as... As I went to, you know, through elementary school, um, my favorite subjects were fish. You know, I I quickly found that I understood how a fish looked as far as its fins, scales, head, uh, proportions, you know, something that a lot of artists 
and art that I saw, even, you know, adults, the artwork of adults, they didn't seem to understand how to draw a fish. You know, a lot of fish that people draw look kind of like the Jesus fish, just a little, you know, ellipse here, ellipse there. <laughs> and you end up with uh, the, a lot of great artwork. Like if you if you look at a lot of artwork by the masters, they would paint a beautiful mermaid or an alligator and there's fish in the in the painting but the fish looked it looked nothing like a fish they don't have the right fins the scales don't look right and this is something i noticed fairly young so i wanted to be like this great fish artist i'm like i'm going to be a great fish artist you know i'm going to be a fish artist and and just paint fish and then i uh we didn't have you know we we couldn't search online obviously because we didn't have the internet yet but uh all the books I would look through art books all day and all night and I couldn't find very many good fish artists. So I decided probably about 10 years old that I was going to be a great fish artist. And maybe at best you would find artists that were doing saltwater fish, but, but definitely not freshwater, like not cichlids, not placostomus, right? Definitely not. And, and that's, that was the niche that I fell into as I got older. At, by the time I started high school, um, you know, I went through the junior high phase where you're kind of more interested in like girls becoming interesting, you know, <laughs> and uh, and uh, you kind of fall away from from the things that you do because you're so interested in puberty. Hey, girls love <laughs> and, uh, girls love fish artwork. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, at 14, I got an opportunity to take a. a experimental class at a nature center that was opening up and I was the youngest person I was not supposed to be old enough you had to be 16 to, to enroll but my teachers put in a word of recommendation because they knew that I was so passionate about my love for fish and and uh, this was a nature center that was on the on the coast um, the Chula Vista Nature Interpretive Center it just got built and they wanted to have the best students there and they Propose, pro, eh, petition for me to go and fill out forms that allowed me to work there because it was a it was an intern type class um, to to work there at the age of fourteen. So I at eight, at the age of fourteen I became a public aquarist. That was my first paid job. I was getting paid five bucks an hour. Minimum wage at the time was three twenty five. But uh, I worked for the duration. It was a, a two and a half month course through, you know, through that summer, my freshman summer. And they asked if I could stay and continue to work um, as a partially paid volunteer. So, um, so that was my first job working with fish professionally. That same summer, I started working at a fish room at this guy's uh, garage. You know, his, uh, he's, he's kind of an icon in the industry, but he stays off of social media. His name is Ron Susie. And he would sell Rift Lake cichlids. You know, some people say African cichlids. I prefer to say Rift Lake cichlids because we're talking about Lake Malawi, Lake Tanganyika, and then a few of the ones from the Victoria Basin, the, the Lake Victoria cichlids. So this guy had, like, fish that I'd never seen before at fish stores. And I was so fascinated my you know my dad dropped me off and I would just look at the fish and I could not believe the different types of fish that I was not aware of I'm incredibly jealous of your first jobs <laughs> you had <laughs> yeah, awesome job, awesome right? first jobs I was like yeah, and and you know the, the the my limited access to books you know right now you wouldn't believe how many books I have I have and and it's only half of what I used to have but I have probably about I mean, I'm looking at uh, in one of my rooms that has books, about 2,000 books and periodicals and stuff like that. And all, the other room has about the same number. All tropical fish related? Or... Fish, nature, okay. uh, plant, wow. but reptiles, amphibians, um, just ridiculous. That, that's and awesome. My that's obsession. very impressive. You know, I had limited access to these books, so I didn't really know the extent of the number of fish 
out there that was available to have in the aquarium. So by working with this guy, Ron, uh, I remember the company was called SNS Cichlids. He was a real innovator. Trust me. He was like one of the guys that uh, was the first one to breed like, you know, 50 species of, of cichlids. And this guy said, you know, you can, you can hang out here. If you're going to be hanging out here long enough, you can help me clean up because it started off with me like wiping the spots off the tanks because I wanted to look at them, you know? <laughs> Your and fingerprints. Like, you can help me clean some algae. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can basically work for fish. So, heck, you know, I started keeping reflex cichlids about 14 years old. Maybe, I don't think I was 15 yet. Wow. And, um, yeah, that opened up a whole new world to me. And because it was such a fascinating, and it was so new in the hobby back then, um, you know, they, they were all kept abundantly in the hobby in the late seventies. And we're talking about the, the late nineties, I mean, late eighties. So this is when, uh, when I was keeping fish that the else I knew had. And, uh, I went from there. So I went into working at a tropical fish store. And, uh, the funny thing about that is one of the people I work with now, he's the, the head administrator for a uh, charter school that specializes in, in uh, uh, high-tech learning, you know, uh, focal, focal uh, learning of subjects that are non-traditional. The programs that are there are the herpetology program and ornamental aquarium fish program. And this is like, like no other I've ever even heard of. So I help this guy. I'm a, I'm a volunteer teacher there right now. Uh, they've been asking me to come on staff, but I, I prefer to do it as a volunteer uh, basis so that I don't have, I don't, I'm not obligated to be there all the time. But uh, this school has a fish room with over, I'd say 50 tanks. They have a display tank in the hall, in the main hall, that I had once set up with the people from Tank, you know, from the TV show Tank, and uh, so we moved it from Petco headquarters to this school. It's called High Tech High, and it's the only school I know of that has a ornamental aquarium fish program. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> so I go there and of them that do. I do lectures periodically. That is very unique. And the greatest thing, and here's the here's the craziest thing about it. The, the first guy that hired me at a fish aquarium shop, he's the head administrator for that school. Oh wow. Yeah, so he knew you from uh, early on and knew that uh, you knew you knew your stuff and were passionate about it. So what what better person to share it with the kids then? And I feel blessed. You know, I mean, working with kids is nothing better. I'd like to do my. I expect my son to be going to that school next year. Um, he's 13 now. He has uh, three aquariums, uh, quite a few reptiles, and a collection of spiders. So that leads me to my <laughs> – so uh, on the note of, of the kids and the youth then, um, are you seeing a genuine interest then in uh, with these kids in keeping their own personal aquariums? Or is this just something that's really fun at school that, you know, they, they wouldn't want to pursue outside? Because um, as we were talking about earlier with uh, – you know, shrinking number of mom and pop pet stores compared to, you know, when we were growing up, um, you know, to what's available now, uh, getting our, getting the youth involved in the hobby, getting them interested. I mean, that's going to be, you know, that's going to be what continues this hobby. I mean, you know, you go to a fish club meeting and the average age is probably 50, maybe even over that of people in the room. Um, you know, and it's, it's very, uh, disconcerting that we don't see more youth. Now, granted, some of these are, are in the evening, but, um, you know, what, what's the vibe you get from the kids? Yeah, this particular group of kids, I'd say about 75% of them have aquariums at home. And, um, about half of those got aquariums because they got involved in this program. Oh, now, excellent. some of them have parents that were into it also, so, um, you know, so that helps. Yeah, no, that's promising, though. 
It is. Uh, you know, San Diego has one of the oldest aquarium clubs in the whole U.S., the San Diego Tropical Fish Society. Mm-hmm. But there have been a lot of questions about, like, the average age of the members. Um, you know, they've tried a few different things to get younger people in there. But there, there's been, like, some people saying, well, I think we have the same guys here. Uh, you know, every auction is the same types of fish, the same plants. And, and we need people with, with a broader interest level to, to to stimulate, like, more people to come to the meeting. So up north of us in Orange County, there is a club called Coast. And they have more of the high, high-level aquarists that are members and members there. And you'll see some of the younger people there. We're talking about a lot of rare cichlids. And then they, they, they book higher level speakers there, such as Rusty Wessel, Paul, Paul Lozell. Oh, um, so very, very uh, fam- famous in the hobby. Well known. Yeah, add, <laughs> you know, so these are some people that, that really brought us a lot of the books that we have and a lot of the species we have in the hobby. Are are they doing good stuff to also help encourage uh, more youth in the hobby as well? Uh, you know, both clubs are trying. They, they, I mean, there's it's not for lack of trying that it's not happening. I just think right now one of the biggest concerns I have with the hobby is that younger people have a lot of distractions. There's a lot more things that they can do. Um, social media, I mean, half the kids I know, you know, you see them sitting on their phones all day. Yeah, that's uh, definitely a, a a concerning trend as well. Um, and you know, the a previous guest that I had on the show, um, Brendan, a fourteen year old up in Canada, you know, that's one of his complaints of his co uh, of his classmates rather and his friends that they would rather play video games all day long than to uh, to take uh, care of a fish tank. Uh, but I mean, this kid is just absolutely passionate about it. Uh, his dad got him a ten gallon tank with some guppies when he was real young, and that that hooked him. Um, and I asked him, you know, are you, are you trying to convert any friends? And he says, yeah, he's trying to convert a couple right now. And he thinks he's close to one of his buddies, uh, converting them over to be a fish fanatic. So if that happens, I told him to give me a report back and, uh, kind of what his strategy was and we'll, we'll disseminate that information. So we'll see if we can't convert, uh, some more kids over. Yeah, that's great to hear. I just, uh, I was excited this past Christmas because my nephew, who's 12 years old, is a little bit younger than my son. He, you know, asked me about getting an aquarium and so I helped him to get all the things he needed and so what he got instead of getting your typical things that most kids get for Christmas he asked everyone for different parts of the aquarium so he got you know the aquarium the heater the lighting and and uh my mom got him some uh, some fish and and plants for his tank oh that's awesome and that was pretty interesting so, so Sam, I've I've actually kicked around this idea. Now you're going to be closer to this person, so I'm going to task uh, you with this with this mission. Um, so you need to get one of the Kardashians to start up a 10 gallon <laughs> tank, throw in some cherry shrimp in there, and throw some uh, zebra Daniels or some other cool fish. Get it aquascaped, and then have them Snapchat or tweet about it. And I think uh, I think <laughs> we will have droves in droves of uh of teenagers and young adults and probably old adults as well wanting to get into the hobby so all the local fish stores will have to uh brace for this onslaught of customers but that is your mission get one of the kardashians (laughs) to keep a fish tank and tweet about it it's it's funny because i i don't know any of them personally (laughs) but i do know people that know them personally so there is two degrees of separation. Yeah, there you go. So not quite the uh, the six or seven degrees with Kevin Bacon, but hey, you're even closer. So uh, yeah, you're in Southern California, <laughs> man. You and your buddies, make that happen. Let's get more people in the hobby via the Kardashian effect. And there's also uh, there's also the tank effect, you know. So um, I I'm very good friends with Brett and Wade, who do uh, Animal Planet's TV show Tanked. Um, I've been on a few episodes. And, you know, I hang out with, with them every time I go to Las Vegas. Oh, that is excellent. I'm going to go back and look for you in those episodes. Well, <laughs> maybe you're in the background. There, now, there are – yeah, I'll, I'll let you know which ones um, later. I'll, I'll give you links or something. But uh, the, the, the 
interesting thing is how polarizing they can be. You got you got half of the hobby who are a little bit elitist, and they just want to criticize everything about about the show. They want to criticize you know the way they do things. Uh, they basically want to criticize a a, a one hour show that actually takes many weeks to film. And you know having been on set. I, I know that not what you're seeing on TV is not what is actually happening happening for the builds. The good thing about it, though, is that they do a lot of exposure of aquariums to people that may have never even thought about it. Yeah, and I think that's a huge point. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's publicity one way or the other, whether you like their personalities or not. Um, and, and the same thing with YouTube as well. Maybe somebody that never kept a fish tank stumbles onto one of the YouTube personalities. You know, they, they may have, uh, you know, that really over the top YouTube personality, or they may be the kind that's just real laid back as they go through their videos. But, you know, exposing somebody that doesn't keep fish tanks to that and sparking their interest, you know, that's, that's really important. And that's how, um, you know, you can get somebody back in the hobby. And I, and I think, you know, for me, I got back into the hobby just because we went to a pet store to look at some some rabbit food or something, and um, seeing you know one of the one of the small nano tanks that was aquascaped, it just rekindled my passion for the uh, for the fish tank, and then I had to start crafting. You know, how am I going to convince my wife to let me get my small tank, and then the rest, like I said, is history from there. Now I've got multiple tanks, and you know, hope to continue to grow the armada of glass boxes with fish and water in them. You know, back in uh, about two thousand five or 2006 I was managing a store during a time that we were going through kind of a recession and the the people stopped buying these big tanks you know the the main the main uh, business for the shop was was you know 50 350 gallon reef aquariums and and you know advanced systems and they would you know sell systems for anywhere from you know, eight hundred dollars to like twenty thousand dollars, but they counted on having a few sales a week to stay in business, and they were failing. So you know, the money was going down really fast, and I had just started working there. But being as a devout a hobbyist as I was, I knew that hobbyists would not give up what they love because they couldn't afford it. <laughs> I mean. It's like uh, it's like any addiction, you know. People still want to have fish, so I really shifted everything over there, um, you know, at the behest of the owner. I shifted everything over to nano tanks. I literally, on my own, just uh, you know, uh, set up a whole section just for nano this, nano that, and and I knew about nano tanks because I'd been doing nano tanks um for many years before that but you know it wasn't a craze yet and so um i was the first one to bring to san diego uh, all the freshwater shrimps and the, the tiny fish like boraras and uh micro corridoras and and aspidoras um tiny hara fish uh pea puffers so i brought in all these rare fish into the shop and and it really survived a period of time where it could have went out of business and it became the most profitable store in the region. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. I mean, I've got no macroeconomic data points uh, of, you know, fish tank sales receipts, but um, you know, it, it seems like having that 50 gallon plus tank in the living room with your Oscar and your giant placostomus, now nothing against the, the Oscars, um, but that was, you know, kind of a, a an eighties and early nineties, maybe even the, you know, early two thousands trend. And, you know, we almost kind of scoffed at the small tanks, right? Like, come on, you can't have a small tank in your living room. You need you need a 100-gallon tank with, you know, three gigantic Oscars. You know, you put your finger in there and it wants to bite it, you know, like that. Like that was an American tank, you know. Uh, but now you're just seeing how absolutely beautiful and amazing uh, these smaller tanks can be. Um, now, sure, maybe you need to inject a little CO2 and do liquid ferts and all that good stuff. But, I mean, you can have some just absolutely gorgeous aquascape tanks and have, you know, 10 
um, neon tetras and some of those, you know, uh, other small fish in there. Um, and it, it is an absolutely stunning, uh, maybe more so than, you know, a tank that we would have seen in a typical house in the 80s. Yeah, and, you know, my, my late friend, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with him, Takashi Amon. Mm -hmm. Um, he basically reinvented the nature aquarium and, um, he, he turned it into, you know, of an art piece, a living art piece. And so many people followed in his footsteps and from there it branched out. I'm part of a coalition of international aquarists who, um, promote biotope aquariums. Um, some of my friends are in uh, in Europe, um, all over Europe, and I'm basically the only the only main person from the U.S. as part of this group. We have a Facebook page on on Facebook, <laughs> obviously. It's called Biotope Sticks, and we basically we created a a system of of types of aquariums um, called the B system, the biotope system. And some of them follow strict biotope rules that uh, for those of you who are listening that don't understand what a biotope is, that basically it's a slice of nature, how it would be in the wild if it was undisturbed. So, so you know, some of them follow the strict rules of, of all fish from one specific niche in a specific river in a specific region. Others are more like fish from one region or fish and plants from one region. Others are uh, fish and plants from one continent, you know, and they all have their different classifications under the bee system. And um, it's a, it's a growing trend. And one of our good friends, uh, I don't, uh, you may be familiar with him. His name is Heiko Blair. Yep. Yep. I've heard the name. Um, yeah. So he's a good friend of mine and he uh, produced a book recently called Blair's Biotopes really instrumental in in introducing like hundreds if not thousands of species to the hobby and you know like anyone that's that becomes an icon in the hobby he has people that don't like him and then there's but there's a lot of people that really really do like him and appreciate what he does and and so his book Blair's Biotope is absolutely phenomenal it's a big book and it helps to make it easier for people to to create, you know, uh, region specific aquarium sets so they can, they can feel like a public aquarist, you know, they can feel like they have a public aquarium in their home rather than just a, a tank that's novelty that's just full of fish from all over the place. One more time, what was that Facebook group name again? You cut out a little bit when you said it was Biotope. Biotope Aquaristics. Okay, Biotope Aquaristic. So I will uh, link that as well. Uh, that'll be something that I link in the show notes so uh, people can uh, can check that out. Um, I will say so. Uh, one of the one of the future tanks that I, I want to do. I, I don't have it. Um, I, I don't have the tank yet, or, or know what I'm going to get. But um, I, I know I want to do a much better job at aquascaping. And so for me, um, I definitely want to check out this Facebook group. Um, but I've also recently purchased uh, Karen Randall. She came out with a new book, The Sunken Gardens. So I'm about a quarter way into that book. Um, and I just want to, I'm just trying to absorb as much as, uh, as I can of good aquascaping principles, um, and really taking a lot of good content so that as I, as I do my next aquascape, um, this will actually be my first and true aquascape as opposed to just throwing some plants here or there and hoping everything goes well. Like I, um, cause me, my personality, like I'm just so impatient. I always want to go now, now, now. Um, uh, but this next tank, I, I really want to do it justice and I want to take my time. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely want to check out, uh, the biotope group that you're talking about on Facebook, uh, but continue to read the, uh, the Karen Randall book. And, and I don't know if you've got a, if you've added that to your library or not, but, um, so far I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, yeah it's like called it. Sunk, sunken gardens, absolutely beautiful, uh, color, color photos in there. Um, so far she's, you know, d does a great job of walking through some of the beginning, pr the beginner principles, um, which for me, um, you know, definitely a beginner here. So I can really appreciate that. Yeah. She, I mean, she writes good articles, you know, so I, I can assume that her book is going to be a great book. 
Yeah, definitely. So let's uh, let, let's go back to your artwork now. So I'm looking at, uh, I'm going through looking at your fine art prints on Threadless. Um, I'm also checking out your uh, your Facebook page. So you you said you finally just got around to completing your Dovi. So that guy is looking pretty awesome. Was that a commission or is that just one that you've been wanting to do for a while? Well, I've had a lot of people ask about it. So the original is actually, it's still available at this point. But a lot of people have asked, do you have a print of Adobe Eye? You know, and Adobe Eye, yeah, they also, also it's cousin the Managuense. You know, I had, I have a, a half-hearted <laughs> uh, art piece of Managuense where it only shows his head. That's what I mean by half-hearted. Um, and I, I do plan on doing a full body image of the Managuense. And uh, the Dovi eye, though, a lot of people were asking about it, and I was like, ah, I don't have one. I wish I had one. I wish I had one. And so, literally for years, I've been putting it off. And you know, I started one a couple years ago. I started like with the body outline, and then I think I painted over it because somebody wanted something else, and I said, I'll just use this. And so I painted over it, and then I, it's just on a whim. I'm like, you know what? I really need to do a Dovi eye. So it's a good thing I did. There's a lot of people requesting the print. Um, just so the listeners know, you can either buy prints through my Threadless site, which uh, they do print on demand. They have bigger sizes. Um, they have print on canvas. They have print on on uh, other materials as well. But you can also buy, if you want, uh, open edition prints. I do smaller prints directly from me. So if if you go to my Facebook page, you can message me there and you can buy directly from me. And your Facebook page is uh, facebook.com and it's Sam Scales, S C A L Z. And again, that'll be something that I link in the show notes for people to check out. Um, and if you've never. Actually, the one, the one you want to go to is not Sam Scales. It's, uh, it's going to be Scales Nature Artist. Ah, okay. So. So I, I have it. I need to I, check I, that out. I, I'm unaware that you weren't on that other page yet. So. <laughs> I think that's a problem with social media, though. You have so many uh, between all the different platforms and having a page versus your your own personal, um, you know, Facebook profile. I mean, there's just so many that you have to keep track of. So um, I'm going to check that one out. But yeah, that so that the Dovi, I, that's where I saw I was on your uh, Sam Scales one. So um, one more time, that other one is Scales Nature Artist. Yeah, you'd be it would be www.facebook.com backslash scales nature artist and just so everyone knows you have to spell scales s-c-a-l-z okay and so the dovi is also up on there um and some of your more recent ones mm -hmm. it looks like a, a beautiful koi and an uh arowana as well really colorful um arowana yeah that was a a little a little exaggerated rainbow arowana, but <laughs> I always wanted to do a little exaggerated arowana. No, it's excellent. And I think, uh, you know, again, listeners, please go and actually check out Sam's work. Um, my descriptions are, are not going to do it justice, but a lot of your um, your artwork, you have it in a natural setting. So like the Dovi Eye, it's against, you know, fallen, fallen uh, um, uh, branches in the water. You've got wonderful uh, lighting going on. So it's very much in, in its element. Uh, but then you also have a style where you just kind of take the fish and put it in this, you know, put it against a white background. So like with that rainbow arowana, just the color just really pops and um, definitely a different take on your style. But the fact that you can kind of, you know, do the nature scene and then also do this other um, more artistic interpretation, if you will, um, I think that's, you know, really telling of your ability as an artist to be flexible like that. Yeah, yeah I, like, I like to try different things. I, I never know exactly what what people are going to want. I personally like to do the whole background, but uh, for the purpose of printing on like on apparel, you know, so if you go to my Threadless site, you can also buy on a lot of my artwork on t-shirts and sweaters. Throw pillows and, uh, as well. Uh, notebooks, everything like that, you know, <laughs> mugs. Um, so sometimes the, the, the portrait style, which which excludes the background, works better on on those items. So let's say, um, you know, let's say I wanted to commission you, right? Like just to give people an idea of, of the process. Um, so I've got some really beautiful, we'll throw it out there, 
Bozamani rainbows. Um, and I would want you to paint or to, to draw, um, paint or dry. I, I don't know which one's the correct term for your, for your artwork. Um, but to, to create, um, a male Bozamani rainbow just in full flash displaying color, um, you know, do I need to send you a picture of that or, you know, is it just, I can message you and say, Hey Sam, this is, this is what I want. Um, I want it in a natural setting. You do your thing. Um, I mean, kind of walk me through that process. Well, uh, you're in luck. I actually just painted the uh, last year. I painted a, a trio of Bozmani rainbows, two males and a, you know, fighting over a female. Oh, nice. Um, I was inspired by my friend, Martin Luther, Luther, Luther <laughs> who, uh, who uh, studies the wild Bozmani rainbow, which is very in peril uh, where it is found naturally in the Armayu lakes. And um, I was inspired by some of his photography and videos, so I, I painted a trio of those. So basically what I, what I do for a client is I ask, hey, uh, you're interested in artwork? Uh, First of all, I'd like to know what like what size you're interested in, and the typical sizes I work in are ones that will fit into a ready-made frame, and I, it just makes it easier for the client than having to buy a custom frame. So it's eight by ten. I mean, I can go as small as five by seven, but um, you can go eight by ten, uh, eleven by fourteen, sixteen by twenty, uh, twenty by twenty-four. Uh, or 18 by 24 and I can also paint on canvas but the majority of my work that I do right now is going to be uh, watercolor and gouache on heavyweight paper so I, I asked the client you know what size they're interested in and then we break it down into like what style do you want it do you want a full background obviously it's going to cost more if I have to you know go into the background and then how many different species are going to be in there. I, I like to know what kind of pose they want. Some people just want a scientific illustration. They just want the fish, just like you see them in books, you know, just sideways, looking dead. <laughs> and and uh, they just want to hang that up like a trophy on their wall, like the species is one I like. I prefer to make my illustrations look alive to the extent like flaring their gills, opening their mouth, um, appearing to look at you. So once I know what they want, then I'll ask specifically if they have any references. Most of the time people are pretty open. They're like, you know what, uh, you know what's going to look best. Just do it your way. I trust you. And um, they'll put a deposit down and then uh, pay the difference when, when they're, I'm finished with the work. Uh, sometimes though, they want a specific fish. So if you want a specific looking fish, Say if you wanted a a dovii who is more gold and you have an idea of what you want it to look like, I appreciate sending references. Uh, if you want one that's more blue, same thing. So you want the fins up, you want the fins closed, you want the mouth open. I need to know those details. I, I want I want the customer to be happy with the piece. They're going to have an original piece of art. I'm I'm extremely affordable for what I do. I I believe in you know not overpricing work. I have sold stuff for quite a bit of money through some of the galleries that represent me, but uh, when I'm working with people directly on commissions on Facebook, I am more than happy to to work within their budget. If they want something with a little less detail, I can easily work within whatever budget they need. You know to be able to afford it. Uh, the other option, of course, is if you can't afford an original, and I do have prints of the species that you want. I, I've, I've done well over species of cichlid, and uh, you know, as, over the years, and I probably still have about 200 species available in print form. So I can, you can always buy prints and it's much cheaper that way. Yeah, I'm going to have to get, uh, you know, offline, we're going to have to connect on those species. And uh, I'm probably just going to uh, ping you offline and say, hey, you know, do you have this? Do you have this? Dig through your library. And uh, I think I want to pick up some more prints from you because, I mean, your work is uh, really awesome. And 
I, I can't um, I can't say how excited I am, you know, enough for the uh, for the print that I have coming of the Epistogramma. Um, and then also, you know, again, this this Tiger Oscar, man, he's just looking at me. He's just looking at me. He says, hey, remember the good times you had when you had an Oscar? You need to put me on your wall. <laughs> you know, sometimes the species that we, we tend to forget about, like, I think there's a lot of Aquarius that become, like I said earlier, elitist. And then they the things that, that they grew up with, they forget about how much they love them. Um, Oscars are one of those fish that, that gets thrown away, you know, as far as uh, it's not a cool fish anymore, you know, because... I got a rare fish or, you know, <laughs> in, pet, in Petco and sells it, right? Oh, want... pet, Petco sells Oscars. Eh, I don't want that. You can get them at Walmart. Eh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if it's not on the care, you know, conservation list, or if it's not something that's rare and cool or trendy, then they don't want it. But, you know, I, I the soft spot for convict cichlids. I love convicts. I don't care how easy they are to breed. Um, I love Oscars. Uh, how can you deny the beauty? If an Oscar was rare, if it only was introduced into the hobby, like last month, everybody and their grandmas would want one. <laughs> yeah, they're they're beautiful fish. And, uh, they really are. And a personality that you just can't beat. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean they they so, you know they get they get to a, a large size, but they're not you know they're not so large that you know a hundred gallon is is going to hold two of them. And if you're doing some frequent water changes, you can go down to seventy five. I would say. Um, with some other fish. I mean, I kept my two Oscars with clown loaches and a pleco. And I mean, that was an awesome, I think that was a 125 that I had uh, those fish in. And I mean, I, I love that tank. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's, that's, see, that's what, that's the kind of tanks I remember being totally enthralled by growing up when I kind of a tank in a, in a fish store. Mm -hmm. um, it was, amazing. I remember the first albino Oscar I saw Everybody wanted this fish, and it was twenty five hundred dollars. Whoa! <laughs> and they they just weren't in the hobby yet, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's crazy. Time flies, and you know, just like albino leopard geckos, albino Burmese pythons. You know, they they once you start breeding things, they all go down in price. Yeah, so we'll and see. Uh, we'll, we'll try and time capsule this conversation. We'll come back in 10 years and we'll see what the zebra pleco is going for. <laughs> right? Yeah, it'll probably be common. Yeah, it's like, a, then. Yeah, it that, like that a... Petco started carrying that thing about a couple months ago. It's down to six ninety nine. dollars <laughs> Yeah, 50% off. So. Yeah. All right, Sam, we'll, uh, you know, Thank you very much again. I, I can't uh, stress how much you know. I've uh, I'm enjoying your just looking at your artwork. How excited I am to get the uh, the epistogramma print. Uh, looking forward to getting you know checking out what else you have um, that uh, artwork that I can put on my walls. Uh, you know I'm I'm not a huge art connoisseur, but I can definitely see the um, the beauty in the work that you do. And you know having such a strong passion for keeping fish. Um, any Aquarius out there, anybody listening to this, you should have at least one piece of uh, Sam's artwork up on your wall or on your desk somewhere framed. Um, you just do really, really excellent work. And, you know, as you can tell throughout this conversation that we've had that you are an Aquarius, you are, an, uh, you are a hobbyist, you're passionate about this, you want to grow the hobby, you want the youth to be involved. So support Sam as an artist, um, you know, pick up some of his artwork because you will not regret it. And if you regret it, email me, I'll buy it off you. How about that? Because I'm sure that I will like it. So, <laughs> and you'll you'll like it too. So, Sam, thank you very much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it, um, and I definitely want to have you back on the show again in the future. Anytime, man. Thanks for having me. I really I really enjoyed talking with you, and uh, you know, hopefully, we can talk about any specific subject you want. Um, I, I I delve into so many topics when it comes to the aquarium hobby that I don't know if I could find a subject that i don't i don't like yeah no that sounds good man challenge accepted let's do it awesome you have a good night now good night thank you again sam you are a great steward of our hobby and are doing great work to educate the youth about fish in general i would encourage everyone listening to check out sam's artwork on his facebook or threadless page i will link those in the show notes for you i challenge you to peruse his offerings and try and find something that you don't like as always you can contact me on any of the Aquarist Podcast social media accounts through at Aquarist Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or just an old-fashioned email to aquaristpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you all for listening. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast with your fish nerd friends.
I truly appreciate it. And I think my new exit line will be this. Get involved in your local fish club, help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds. Thanks for listening.